If there's one thing to remember, it's this. Fire fades, and it's inevitable and natural for the world to return to dark. The future is dark, but it was not always this way. Let's go back to where there was a flame. The hero has made it to the kiln, where the first flame was found, thrived, faded, and was kindled again. The hero descends to kill the god who kindled that flame. This god is a shell now, a husk. He's lost his kingdom, his knights, his wife, children, and friends. But even with nothing left, he sacrificed himself to keep the dark at bay. This is the story of a man who fought against the inevitable. In the beginning, there were two planes of existence. There was the above, and the below. Above was grey, with dragons who had existed forever. Nothing changed, nothing progressed, and nothing lived or died. I think of the below as dark, although it probably was nothing of the sort. How can darkness exist without light? But that was about to change, because when the flame came, it created disparity. Now there was light and dark, and the light illuminated the creatures who were hiding. These creatures emerged to inspect the flame, and these were the ones who had become known as giants. For within the flame was great power, and four giants claimed this power. They claimed it, and it shaped them. Nito came to embody death. The Witch of Isolith represented life. Lord Gwyn stood for the light, and the pygmy kept his dark soul a secret. Gwyn decreed that the flame was more powerful than the grey existence up above, and the giants declared war on the dragons to claim the surface. Alas, the dragons were immortal, and many knights of Gwyn fell, but there was one dragon who betrayed his own. Seath the Scaleless, born without the stone scales of immortality, told the dragon's weakness to Gwyn. The stone scales were the secret to their immortality, and the lightning was their weakness. So Gwyn and his knights fashioned bolts of lightning to peel apart their stone scales. Nito unleashed disease on their exposed flesh, and the Witch of Isleth and her followers used fire sorceries to burn their homes, the arch trees, to ash. And the dragons were no more. And so, the Age of Fire was born, and the giants began their own story. But since this is a story about light, it is also a story about dark. For it is inevitable that one day the flame will fade, and only dark will remain. Seath was granted three rewards. He received a piece of Gwyn's Lord Soul, a dukedom in Gwyn's kingdom, and his own research facility to discover immortality, something he never would have had with the dragons around. The Age of Fire had changed the shape of the world. Gwyn's kingdom grew during the Age of Fire, and the lands outside assumedly looked to Lordran as their capital city. Anor Londo was built close to the sun, and eventually smaller towns and cities grew to surround it. The giants became the royalty and the gods, and humanity spread, worshipping those more powerful than them. Gwyn himself had a wife whose name is not known, and by her he had three children. His firstborn was the god of war, who formed the warriors of sunlight. However, he lost the annals, which were historical records. Gwyn decreed that his son would share the same fate, and all record of the firstborn was stripped from the land. Gwyn's secondborn, Guinevere, was well loved, with her own statues and covenant, the princess guard. The third of birth was Gwendolyn, who was born frail and deformed. He was raised as a daughter, since he was proficient at moonlight magic, which is considered a female trait. His existence was hidden, and his covenant, the Blade of the Dark Moons, hunt down sinners and protect the illusion of power in Anor Londo. For hundreds of years, the Lords prospered, but everything ends. Locked away in his archives, Seath is desperately searching for the secret to immortality. The six-eyed channelers read for him, and search the world for test subjects. These test subjects are locked away in crystal golems for transportation back to the archives, where they become the subject of his experiments. At the base of the prison, there are pasakas, twisted monsters created from captured maidens. If you listen carefully, you can hear them crying. At some point, the knowledge in the archives sends Seath mad. It's impossible to know whether he was insane before or after his experiments on the maidens, but one way or another, Gwyn turns a blind eye to the happenings in the archives. Perhaps it was this that led to the rebellion against the gods. In the war against the dragons, Lord Gwyn had a friend and compatriot named Havel the Rock, who was the sworn enemy of magic and Seath the Scaleless. After the war, Gwyn granted Seath dukedom and a part of his own soul. Perhaps Havel was bitter at Gwyn's preference for Seath, since he started to collect items capable of killing the gods. 
Hidden in his basement in Anor Londo, there is an occult club. Items of the occult can kill the gods and are rightly feared. Havel was also a bishop of the church, who knew the whereabouts of the Dark Ember. Lastly, the Effigy Shield states that there was once an ill-fated plot to destroy the gods. Ill-fated, because the attempt failed. Among the royalty, there are rumours of a hero locked away in a stone cell by a dear friend. They say he was locked away for his own good, which led many to believe that the man inside had gone hollow. Havel helped Gwyn win his throne, but met with the fate of the undead and was kept in a cell so he could not harm others. That's what they would have you believe. But what if Gwyn learnt of Havel's plan to kill the gods? Perhaps Havel was not hollow when he was locked away. Perhaps he was locked away for the good of the realm, and left to hollow in the middle of an area overrun by hollows. Gwyn would have locked his friend away for the greater good, but was it the right thing to do? This marks the peak of the Age of Fire, and the darkness is looming. Soon Gwyn will need all the friends he can get.